morning. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. First things first, I'd love to invite my young disciples to come forward to gather around for time to worship just with you. Friends, I wanted to tell you a story today. A while ago, there was a race that was filled with runners from around the world. And there was a runner from Kenya named Abel who was winning. But Abel didn't understand the local language and he got confused by all the signs. So confused, in fact, that he thought that he had finished the race and he stopped running. He thought he had won. Now a runner from Spain named Ivan was right behind him. And Ivan saw what was happening. So he started shouting at Abel in Spanish, trying to explain to him that he needed to keep running. But Abel didn't understand Spanish. And Ivan didn't understand Abel's language. So Ivan literally stood behind him and pushed Abel across the finish line to victory. A journalist later asked Ivan, why did you do that? Why did you let him win? And Ivan answered, I didn't let him win. He was going to win. But the journalist insisted again by saying, but you could have won. And Ivan just looked at him and he said, but what would be the merit of that victory? What would be the honor of that medal. What would my mom think about that? Today's sermon is all about how we are all the adopted children of God. And there's something really powerful in that image. It means that God loves us as much as a parent cares for a child. It means that God cares for us more than we may ever know. Like a mother or a father or a grandparent or a friend. I'm a mommy to a little boy. He's only two years old. And I can tell you that this kind of love is powerful. I love him so much that I will often go into his room when he's sleeping just to make sure that he's okay. You know, the Bible tells us that our God knows us and loves us so much that even before a word is on our tongue, our God knows it. There is no height too high, nor depth too deep that can keep us from the love of God. And this kind of incredible love also means that like Ivan, we bear a lot of responsibility. Because to live lives of integrity in honor and in gratitude for that great love that we have all received. It is helpful to ask ourselves as we make choices, what would God think of that? Friends, I challenge you to walk like a child of God with all of the honor 
and all of the responsibility that that great gift entails. A. Thank you, friends. Good morning. I'm here to share today Psalm 139 verses 1 through 12. This passage, this passage speaks to me of the Lord's knowledge and love of us. He is everywhere both day and night. We are never alone. Here are the verses from 1 to 12. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before the word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. You hem me behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me, and your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me, and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is light to you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Apostle Paul says, you are not in the flesh. You are in the spirit, since the spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies, also through his spirit that dwells in you. So then, brothers and sisters, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, is that very Spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And of children, then, we are heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If, in fact, we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Once upon a time, 
on a Saturday in April. I was ordained by this very presbytery to be a minister in the Presbyterian Church USA. Now, at the same time, my husband and I were actually in the midst of the adoption process. And he, like so many men who are dragging their feet into fatherhood, unhelpfully suggested, you know, maybe you should be ordained for a little while before we move forward with the adoption. Remember, I was ordained on a Saturday. I gave him until Monday. I figured, you know, our adoption agency, the average wait time is about 18 months for an adoptive family to be chosen by a birth mother. So I thought we had plenty of time. I was wrong. We're in the books on Monday. That Thursday, which happened to break all of the agency's records, we received the call telling us that an expectant mother had chosen us to be the parents of her son. We met this beautiful and precious baby boy on the day that he was born. And then his mother placed him in our arms, entrusting him to our care with a love and a courage and a selfless bravery that goes beyond description. My husband and I bought, brought this beautiful boy home from the hospital. And then just a few days before Christmas that year, with him dressed up in a little Santa costume, we stood together before a judge in a courthouse. And we vowed that we would be his parents and that forever he would be our son. And we were officially and legally declared to be a family. You know, there's a time not that long ago in our country, perhaps you remember it, perhaps you yourself have lived it, when our story, when our family's story, would be too taboo for us to share aloud. Not that long ago, nearly everything related to adoption was hidden with young women mysteriously going away for a while, and with parents so afraid that their children would be branded as illegitimate, that they never told them that they were adopted. For many families, adoption became a deep, dark, and shameful secret. Underlying all of the secrecy and shame were deep-rooted assumptions about blood and biology, about legitimacy and love, and ultimately about what makes a family a family. Is it a mom? A dad? 2.5 kids, a dog, a white picket fence. You know, in different but similar ways, the same has been true for the families of people who are lesbian or gay or transgender. As they navigate a world that defines family and love differently in ways. The same has been true for families who have experienced divorce, or families with single parents, or interracial families, or basically anyone or any family who didn't fit neatly into that one mold. My sister gave birth to a baby girl only a few weeks before our son was born. 
And at the time, a 97 year old woman that my mother knows, who obviously comes from a very different time and a much older school of thought, warned my mother, you will never be able to love your adopted grandson as much as you'll love your own flesh and blood. In her mind, there is one and only one way to be a family. Only one legitimate way to love and to be loved. We cling too forcefully to our vision of the world and the way that we think that the world should be. Our vision becomes narrower and narrower. One way to love, one way to be loved, one way to be a church, one way to worship God. One way, one way, one and only way until Paul cries out, Abba, Father, do you not see that all of you have been adopted by God? Paul says, do you not recognize that you are no longer a slave to these old ways? Your vision of everything is done as it's always been done. Of a love so limited and a God so small is too narrow. For you all have been adopted. You are a child of God. You are an heir of God. This is what Paul proclaims to the Romans in our passage today. To both the Jews and to the Gentiles. Which doesn't seem like much to us now. But what is it? huge at his time. Because you are children, Paul says, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Now I want you to catch this because it's interesting that this word is left as it is in scripture. You see, Abba is the name for God that Jesus called out from the cross. It's more intimate than Ab, which is the more formal Aramaic word for father. It's the word that young children use, like our children, when they say, Daddy. And Paul says that our hearts Cry out, Abba, Father. Paul describes a vision of a God whose love is so powerful and so great and so wide that all are invited to share in this intimacy and to be in this family, Jew and Gentile, slave and free, male and female. The adoption he describes is not an adoption that's secret and hidden and shameful. No, actually, in a number of tablets from ancient times, there's been found what's called a verba solemnia. It means a solemn declaration. During this declaration, it publicly identified a child with their adoptive parents. The adoptee would say, you are my father, and you are my mother. And then the adoptive parents would respond, and you are my son. You are my daughter. Paul describes an adoption like this. 
in which God proudly proclaims, I will be your God, and you shall be my people. In times of strength, we are adopted like Moses was adopted by Pharaoh's daughter, who raised him to become a prince. We are adopted as Genebeth was adopted in First Kings by the queen, who was welcomed as a son of the Pharaoh. And friends, in times of sorrow, we are adopted like Esther, whose uncle Mordecai adopted her after her own parents died. In these times, we are taken directly under the comfort of God's wings. A lesson I've learned, and I've said a lot in these past few years, as I have been so blessed to be Emerson's mommy. Adoption is love. Every night we say a prayer before bed with him. It's always the same. We first thank God for the good things of our day. Today it involved feeding the ducks at the park, going up for a walk, and watching The Incredibles, I don't even know how many times. And we thank God for all of the many blessings in our lives. But then, we pray for Mommy and Daddy and Darby and Charlie, our dogs, and for all of our family. But we always, each and every time, end our prayer by praying for Emerson's birth mommy. Who we say each and every night, who loves us very You see, what we have is what's called an open adoption. We send his birth mother pictures, and we FaceTime her, and we try to visit in person each year. And this is the way that adoption is now moving. From secrecy to openness. And our hope is that through this, he will always know where he came from. And even more importantly, he will always know that he is loved. In fact, as we tell him, he is such a special baby. He has two families who love him very much very much. Maybe you two don't fit neatly into that mom, dad, 2.5 kid and dog in a white picket fence box. Paul tells us it's more than okay. You, no matter where you come from, are an adopted and beloved child of God. You are loved. Don't ever forget it. And with that, I say, Amen. <laughs>